I hate saying this, but that was an awful game of football by Oxford United. And worst of all, they looked like they couldn't be asked. Hello everybody and welcome back to OUFC Fan View. It's Ian here once again and it's time to do another review of another Oxford United game. Same opposition as last time, but different competition. Oxford were away to Coventry in the Carabao Cup. So these sides met just over a week ago and it was actually the last video I did on the channel so you can go and check that one out. It ended with an agonising defeat for Oxford United. Went going down 3-2 to a last minute Coventry goal and the intensity and the pace of that game was a joy to watch at times, as stressful as it was from an Oxford United point of view. Tonight, my goodness, it couldn't be more different. This was played at a snail's pace with a mere fraction of the intensity of what we saw in that league game. And to be fair, the side that did show the intensity was Coventry. And it's probably only fitting that they were the side that went through because, as I said at the start, they looked like the side that was just more bothered to win. It was only a slender win, though, and it was only a scruffy goal, and I'll probably spend more time talking about the team news than I will about the game. But overall, it is another win for the Sky Blues. Congratulations, Sky Blues fans. It's a uh, domestic treble over Oxford in 2014. Winning the FA Cup, winning the league, and now a win in the League Cup. It finished. Coventry City 1, Oxford United 0. And I'll do what I usually do for all of these reviews. I'll give a rundown of the team news. I'll give a review of the game and I'll give my final thoughts at the end. It might be a bit more of a condensed video than I do usually because, quite frankly, there wasn't a huge amount to talk about. But if you do feel like you want to sit through this video and support the channel, well, good on you. And I'll tell you what would help even more. Ah, hitting that like button because that will help me out quite a lot. And if you do want to jump to just any point of the video, please feel free to do that by using the timestamps. And if you do like the content on the channel, then consider subscribing. So let's run over the team news. And from an Oxford point of view, this team news is probably more exciting than the game. But not surprisingly, like he did in the first round, Des Buckingham using the Carabao Cup to ring the changes. Matt Ingram is back in goal. Greg Lee is at left back. Cameron Brannigan has shaken off his illness, which kept him out of the Blackburn game. Game, and he returns to midfield alongside Josh McEachran and Louis Sibley. It's a first start for Dane Scarlett up top and also a first start for Malcolm Abue on the left wing. It's also nice to see Owen Dale back in an Oxford United first team after getting over his injury. There's still no Elliot Moore because he is injured and there was also no Jordan Thornley on the bench, which was a little surprising. Maybe he was injured, I haven't heard anything. So it could be a first appearance for Jack Curry, who makes his place amongst the subs. And the final shout out goes to Sam Long, who is making his 250th appearance for Oxford United tonight, regardless what you think of him. What a bloody legend. Moving on to Coventry City now and Mark Robbins is doing like Des Buckingham is doing like most managers are going to do and use the Carabao Cup to rotate his squad. Only Captain Latiboudier and Eccles remain in the Sky Blue side from that team that won 3-2 over Oxford. But there is still a heck of a lot of quality in this Coventry side. Casey Palmer and Afron Mason Clark, your name but a few, and uh, Norman Bassett. Coventry fans will get their first chance to see him as he starts up top. But when I look at that bench, it's a bench full of players that tormented Oxford just over a week ago. So if Coventry are losing this game, that bench has got the ability to turn the tide, no doubt about it. And Sky Blues fans, you must be delighted to see Ben Sheaf back in the squad. He takes his place on the bench. Moving on to this game then, and this first half is going to be lightning fast because it was dull, really dull. Coventry at times played some OK football. Oxford really offered nothing. There were a couple of little forays forward, but no sustained pressure. And overall, the passing from Oxford was slow and quite often sloppy. And really, Coventry weren't that much better. They were just a little bit sharper and they had chances. And most notably, the chance which should have put them into the league was Kitchen from a corner after nine minutes. Free header in the box, only about six or seven yards out. Somehow manages to hit the bar with the goal at his mercy. He really should have scored. Oxford got away with that one big time. And then right at the end of the first half as well, Coventry put their best move together probably to 
Silva put a lovely ball down the line and Bassett had a chance to stretch his legs and he got there ahead of Kieran Brown. He beat Brown to the ball and got into the penalty area. He was by the byline, quite close to the goal and he cut it back for Thomas Asante who put his chance wide from about six yards. It was another let off for Oxford who were fortunate to get in at nil nil but really it wasn't a great game at all the only chance Oxford had was towards the end of the half Dave Scarlett did find himself in a bit of space the only time he did so in the whole half but he couldn't get a shot on target it went miles over the bar and that was really it you really didn't miss much at half time nil nil and it was about as lacklustre as an EFL trophy game Oxford were very disjointed and none of the fringe players covered themselves in glory at all and also were fortunate that Coventry were also struggling and it wasn't a pretty game to watch but definitely the Sky Blues should have been ahead and they were the side that were definitely forcing the pace and looked the more dangerous but Kitchen's header that, that really should have gone in but but maybe also that Thomas Asante chance as well it is Thomas Asante and Palmer who have looked Coventry's best players and Bissett looks lively at the top as well but it is still nil nil and from an Oxford United's point of view that's all right. And we move into the second half of this game and Coventry was certainly the better side in this second half and uh, deserved to go on and win the game. If anything, Oxford were just as bad, if not worse. It's been a long time since I've seen Oxford this slow and this sloppy in possession. Coventry were starting to cause Oxford a few problems on 52 minutes down their left-hand side, Oxford's right. Thomas Asante and Palmer getting some joy up against Peter Chioso, who was having a bit of an up-and-down night, it must be said. It did result in a long shot from Allen, which went well wide. Just two minutes after that, Dane Scarlett doing a classic striker coming back to try and help his defence out, gave away a really dumb foul against Kitchen, which gave Coventry a decent chance, actually, from a free kick in a dangerous area, and Greg Lee did well to head it behind for a corner. But the respite didn't last long for Oxford, and on 57 minutes, Coventry took the lead in this game. It's Thomas Asante who got the goal, and it was his long-range effort which looped in off the back of Peter Chioso. Peter Chioso turning his back on the ball, never nice to see. A bit of Paul Parker, Italian 90 style, as the ball looped over Matt Ingram, who was just helpless, couldn't get back in time, and it went into the back of the net. But it all came from Greg Lee playing a terrible blind ball out of defence, really to no one, which just put Oxford back in pressure. It looked like Lee and Kieran Brown had done okay to initially get out of a dangerous area, but just an, another really sloppy pass from Lee, which isn't singling Lee out because everybody was guilty of this in an Oxford shirt today, but it was Lee's ball and Coventry took advantage of it and Coventry took the lead. 69 minutes on the clock and Pista Chioso's up and down night continued as another sweeping Coventry move and Mason Clark got into the penalty area one on one with Chioso. It looked like Peter Chioso bored him down, but thankfully the ref, who was right on the spot, didn't give the penalty. He, it looked a penalty to me, and Peter Chioso definitely got away with one there. And it was quite painful to watch from an Oxford point of view, as Coventry just seemed to get better for the large part in this second half, and the chances just started to come. It's It was all started to look more and more Coventry, one-way traffic, an outrageous piece of skill by Mason Clark to get away from Chioso and Long, and he drilled a shot goalwards, and it forced Ingr Ingram into a very good save, who ended up easily being Oxford's best player on the night. Um, a minute later, it was Ingram again, making his second save in short succession. Uh, Sheaf put in an enticing ball. It was Thomas Asante's header, looked destined for the back of the net, but Ingram, Superman style at full stretch, just got his fingertips to put it behind for a corner. And then just two minutes later, it was Ingram's hat-trick of saves completed um, when he got sucked down to save an effort from Victor Torp. So Ingram very much keeping Oxford in the this game and how Oxford were still in this game at 1-0 was beyond me because they were dreadful. But we entered into the final few moments of the game and not only was I hoping that Oxford could get an equaliser, I was just hoping we could have a shot on goal or a meaningful attack or something. We were that poor in the game and they did a little bit as the game moved into injury time. There was a couple of maybe half dangerous moments. There was one where Goodrum put a ball in for Harris and Harris, I don't know why he didn't just try and 
get his foot on the ball, but he looked like he was in two minds of trying to do a dive in header and just ended up doing nothing. And then there were shots at the end of the game, um, one from Sibley, one from Volks, I believe, which forced Coventry into a little bit of defending and um, uh, finally it was nice to see Oxford at least try to score a goal in this game but all in all it was very poor from an Oxford United point of view Coventry didn't even need to be good in this game to get the win but they did get the win and they move on to round three this game will be quickly forgotten for Oxford United and we just got to concentrate on staying up in the championship now. So I'll move on to my final thoughts. It's, it's not really too much to say about Coventry. Um, look, I don't think you were great tonight, but you didn't need to be good tonight. Oxford didn't put you under any pressure whatsoever because the players could play almost like it was a training or an exhibition game, really. So I, I think from that point of view, Coventry will be pleased with the minutes they got into players' legs. I thought that Mason Clark looked pretty decent at times. I thought Thomas Asante looked pretty decent at times. And I thought the young lad Bassett looked okay in the first half of the game as well. But generally, uh, what as we saw in the league game, Coventry, just whether it's their first team, whether it's their backup team, just looked like they've got a little bit more quality than Oxford United. And uh, that was in full evidence again tonight. And although it wasn't a, a, a game that, anybody's going to remember by any stretch of the imagination you go into round three and good luck to you and um i'm a bit sick of you playing a bit sick of playing you now so um hopefully we won't get you in the fa cup or anything like that and uh we can uh, look forward to getting you back at the kassam where hopefully uh, we might be able to get something against you that moves on to oxford united and um it was really bad. It was really bad tonight. Oxford were, apart from Matt Ingram, who made some good saves in this game, I thought, and Oxford were pretty poor, I thought. I thought they did defend quite well at times, which is what you would expect. You've seen this from this Bez Buckingham side. But on the turnover, or when they had the ball at their feet, they were really slow with their passing, or when they got into dangerous areas, really sloppy with their passing. So many over-hit passes or under-hit passes, it was ridiculous really and it only got a little bit better when you saw like Goodrum come on or Mark Harris come on or Rodriguez come on who you definitely can see have got that those those minutes in their legs and they look more assured on the ball but I thought even Brannigan was poor tonight you didn't see him really get into the game I thought Mark, Mark Malcolm Abue very disappointing he got when I don't want to that's hopefully there's more to come from the young man but he got into chimes where he could have ran one-on-one -on -one with his defender and for some reason he didn't I, I really expected to see a lot more from him Dane Scarlett uh, it was a tough game for him let's not give him too much criticism because Oxford gave him nothing to feed on tonight at all but you would question whether he can really do the donkey work that Mark Harris does or is going to be a hold-up player at all. Like uh, you, You're still questioning what his effectiveness is going to be, but it is still really early days for him. You could definitely see Owen Dale de needs to get back up to full fitness. He looks a, a yard short tonight. Peter Chioso, I'm still question marks over him, um, really. Uh, and You wouldn't be surprised if this new right-back that we bought in from the Netherlands does start taking over as the first-team right-back. Because to me, Peter Chioso still looks a little bit like a League One player, which is uh, maybe a little bit harsh on him as well. I don't think you saw a lot from Louis Sibley, but at least he was the one player I thought that did try to drive forward sometimes from midfield and make things happen. I still kind of think he's a, a useful squad player, if not like a first team player at all. I do, I do definitely think he's got his place in this Oxford United squad. And... All in all, it's a disappointing night. Let's not go too overboard about it. It really did feel like an EFL trophy game. But it does mean this game against Preston does feel quite important now. That's three defeats in a row now in all competitions, uh, which is the sort of form you're going to have to expect at times in the championship. I know it's only two league games and one cup game, but it feels like it's a game where you really need to get something out of it. Even if it's just a draw, we just need uh, to keep that points tally ticking over a little bit, stop that... Um, run of defeats and just keep that feel good factor going because I feel if we lose on Saturday I feel some of that feel good factor that's been there since the start of the season may start to ebb away which would be a real shame this early on so let's hope we get in a much better performance at the weekend from Oxford United I think that we will big house at the Kassam I think that you're going to see a good high 
effort, high energy Oxford United performance. Well, fingers crossed anyway, because no one's going to remember tonight. And quite frankly, well done for not remembering it because it was largely garbage. We move on to the league. Thanks for watching this review. After watching games like this, I really could do with likes. So please hit that like button and I'll be back to do a review of the Preston game. Thanks very much.